from Mr. Pixel, and welcome back. Now today, I want to do another public service, so to speak. But it's not only to you if you are a student. This public service is also kind of an indirect piece of advice to my fellow teachers out there. And the reason I'm doing this is because the world of online learning is growing very, very quickly. And we have access to some of the best artists out there. Um, we can tap into their very unique expertise, their very unique exposure to very unique niches in the artistic industry. And we have this incredible ability to be able to really tailor our education exactly the way we want it. Furthermore, another advantage that I think is really cool about online learning is the fact that you can get to know your artist, you can get to know your teacher at least, um, before you sign up for a class. So it's not only a question of just paying for a school and at the beginning of the year, you get a list of the teachers that you've never heard of or maybe have heard of. And some are loved, some are complete douchebags. <laughs> and, well, you get what you get. And not, not to mention the huge cost that comes with this. Um, these are huge advantages. With this comes very often artists that come from the entertainment industry, video games, film, fantasy art, etc. that might not have any direct teaching experience um, that decide that, hey, I've got the skill, I've got a lot of experience, I've got a lot to offer, I want to I want to make a business out of this, I want to expand and, and reach out and add this other element to my repertoire of expertise, which is wonderful. And I'm wholeheartedly invited, well, for one reason, because this is my <laughs> livelihood. I run an online art school, right? So for me, seeing uh, seeing artists being able to really tailor their education to their specific needs is something that I really, really love. And what's also cool is if I have a student or somebody who, who reaches out to me and reaches out to sign up with my school, but I don't necessarily feel I'm the right fit for them as a teacher, that this list of recommendations um, that I that I share with them is getting bigger and bigger. You want this? Go here. Oh, you want a little bit of that too? Go here. It's a really cool opportunity. But there's a little bit of a caveat to this, and it's the caveat. It's this this situation that can arise as a result of this that I want to shed a light on. Before I do, however do understand where I'm coming from. I'm coming from a place where I want to help this industry grow. I want to, if I'm going to make any contribution to online learning, being my core passion in life, um, I want to contribute in a positive way. Therefore, I am not going to call anybody out. Don't, don't expect it, even if you had a gun to my head. Well, maybe if you had a gun to my head. <laughs> but then I'd make something up just to save my own life. But my purpose, my, my goal is not to call people out, nor do I consider myself by any stretch of the imagination, the penultimate teacher. I am the golden example of teachers. No, I'm, I'm a young little whippersnapper, just like the rest of you guys. And I've got a lot of learning to do. And one of the things I've learned as a teacher is that it's a work in progress. And I always offer the best knowledge that I have, but I've got a lot of work to do and a lot of experience to gain. So take this into account. I'm not saying I'm the best. You, you rest of you guys need to keep up because there's a lot of teachers out there that can wipe the floor with me, in my humble opinion. So where am I, where am I alluding to here? Well, it's there are different philosophies. There are different belief systems when it comes to working in the artistic industry. And I do honestly believe that every teacher comes from a place of good intention. I don't think there's a single teacher out there, there's a single artist out there whose goal is to demoralize or demotivate or humiliate or, or discourage anybody. I don't think that's the case. Well, maybe in a few cases, but those people are such blatant douchebags that they usually get called out very early in the game and it's game over for them sooner than not because it's a small community. <laughs> Word gets around, right? So, but I don't think for the 99% of us out there, I don't think that's the case. However, 
there is there are kind of two if i was to to kind of separate two unique schools of thought when it comes to teaching it's there's some teachers that lead by encouragement that lead by expertise that lead by example and there's other teachers that can lean at least emotionally lean a little bit more towards the survival of the fittest type of mentality uh, it's a competitive world out there there's a lot of people all gutting for your job if you don't kick butt if you don't stand out from the crowd you don't even stand a chance and some there is a grain of truth in that there's definitely a grain of truth in this yes there is it is a very competitive world yes there's a lot of artists out there and we don't even have it that bad you want to know a, an industry that that really struggles look at the world of dance holy smokes right but I'm, we're not going there today but we still have it we can still have it pretty hard in that respect the term starving artist didn't come from nowhere right i think that it's important to shed a light on exactly what it is that we are and how modern day society has kind of changed the attitude of a lot of teachers in some ways in some ways yes in some ways not in some ways it's kind of the same as it's always been but it's when people when certain industries gaming is a very big one film is a very big one the kind of jobs that everybody's gunning for when somebody gets in and gets this prestigious job makes a really good name for themselves that can give that individual a false sense of entitlement and a false sense of importance kind of a, a god complex type of thing like people who believe that they're you know i am superior i am the diamond in the rough that made it and the rest of you want what i have so if you want what i have i'm not going to give it away sparingly and what that ends up leading to is a trickle down effect from from teacher to student um of leading by this philosophy and i would i would kind of label this philosophy as being a little bit of a military attitude this is war buddy if you don't if you don't keep your head down if you don't hold on to your gun if you don't keep your socks clean it's game over for you right and i don't think that when it comes to the art industry and it's not even exclusive to online learning this happens in real schools all the time my daughter went through this with a teacher recently um i find from an artist's perspective and from a humanitarian's perspective and from a teacher's perspective i think this is for the majority of artists and by majority i'd say a good 90 percent at least up to 90 percent of artists out there is extremely counter productive it's the wrong thing to do but i have a lot of thought and a lot of a lot of experience to back up what i'm saying right now okay the reason i'm saying this is because i could give off this false impression taking this particular sense that i like to baby people that i don't prepare people for reality the reality is it's going to be a tough life unless you know how to work your ass off and prove yourself over your peers but that's the confusion and this is why very often i find artists teachers online artists even the most experienced ones out there think that it needs to be a tough love type of relationship with their students for some five percent eight percent maybe yeah some people need a little bit of tough love maybe they got a little bit too pampered growing up maybe they're a little spoiled and entitled maybe mommy and daddy have all the money in the world and the kids grew up just squandering their parents cash on education and didn't learn the value of an effort but that's a very very small proportion i've taught in my time just online i've taught thousands of students thousands and I'd say out of those thousands, I've encountered maybe maximum two or three students that just didn't try. They, it's not that they didn't have the time. They had the time. They had the ability. They had the the personality. They weren't they weren't facing any neurological issues like ADHD or autism or anything like that. I've taught many students like that as well. They just didn't give a shit, and in those situations yes i did deliver them a little bit of honesty and the honesty took the form of 
do you want this job or not? Do you want to pursue this type of career or not? Because we've been together for three, four weeks right now. And it looks to me like you've put a total of 15 minutes worth of work in and you're not working a full-time job or raising three kids on your own. You have all the time in the world. And they'd say, oh, you know, I'm just tired. And, you know, I got caught up, got caught up in games. And it was hard for me to get motivated and everything like that. And I'd say, okay, well, if games and all of these different things are are such a distraction or if it's so difficult for you to find even a, a scratch of motivation to be able to draw something, have you ever stopped to think for a moment that maybe you don't like doing this professionally? Maybe you enjoy doodling, but as soon as it became serious business where you had to make a few little sacrifices to succeed or to grow, you realized it wasn't for you. I've had these experiences in my life. There were certain things that I really, really liked and I, I liked, I loved it as a hobby. I have lots of things that I love doing as hobbies. But if somebody said, would you want to do this professionally? I'd say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not my thing. But it's very much my thing as a hobby. And sometimes people have a hard time distinguishing between the two. Am I going to come down on these, these artists and say, you're wasting my time. You're a loser. You know, you don't have what it takes. No, I don't think that's necessary. Instead, I... I encourage them to take a good hard look at themselves and ask them what they really truly do want. Hey, if somebody's too busy playing video games to draw, then maybe a job in video games might be the thing. So you start asking them what they might like in video games. Oh, I love the way they like the levels and blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, you know, there's a job title called level design or creative director or producer, right? It's not just art. Maybe you just like, maybe you like the way games are constructed. Maybe you have, maybe you have, you're incredibly creative, but not necessarily in the visual arts way. And from that point on, I don't daddy them anymore. I just open their eyes to possibilities. I recognize the fact that they just don't have the passion for it, at least at this particular point in their life. Maybe they just have other priorities or other concerns. And I don't beat myself up about it. I don't take it personally and attack them as losers. Why? Why don't I take that approach? Why don't I take that tough love approach? Well, ask yourself the question, what does it accomplish for the individual? Is my goal to make that person succeed, to force them to succeed through guilt and shame and promises of torture and hardship? No. I, what's the point of that? I don't see the value in doing that for a student. So telling somebody that they're wasting their time, telling somebody that they don't have what it takes is basically, is basically saying, you came here and I'm going to use your time as a student to tell you what you're, what you're not good at. That's exactly what my philosophy was when it came to doing YouTube videos, doing YouTube reviews. I had people, when you're a YouTuber and you get to a certain kind of threshold of subscribers, you literally get 10 emails a day from people who want to do sponsorship videos. And one of the things I mentioned at the beginning of all of my either sponsorship videos or product reviews, which I do a lot on my channel as well for audio equipment and video equipment and all that kind of stuff. Um, if I don't like the product, if I'm not passionate about the product, if it doesn't mean anything to me, if I don't stand behind the company's philosophy, I don't review it, period. So what I tell everybody is this isn't a review. I'm here to tell you all the reasons why I love it <laughs> and make a couple of constructive pieces, offer some constructive feedback on little things you can work out in future iterations of blah, blah, blah said product. I don't feel it's... I don't feel it's it's of any value to anybody to just tell them what they're doing wrong or to tell people what I don't like. My job is to help people grow, not to stunt that growth. And I think this is a, a perspective that I want to share with fellow teachers. If you take your job, so if you take your desire for that person to grow so much, so personally, that you attack somebody for not being good enough or, or you give somebody a shit mark because you expected something of them and they didn't deliver it, not necessarily paying attention to what artistic level they're at. Maybe they're beginners 
and maybe what they accomplished is actually monumental at that particular point in growth and you're taking that for granted, then you're not teaching them for the sake of their growth. You're teaching them, in my humble opinion, to show off how good you are at making other people better at art. It's a per, it become, to me, that's, that kind of attitude is a reflection of your own ego and your own fear of being judged as a bad teacher. And because you take that perspective, if somebody doesn't perform to your liking, you attack them. And it's basically like pointing the blame at somebody else first so they don't think of attacking you, right? Is it, am I trying to be emphatic and say it's all black and white and that it's all good or evil? No. But this is where I feel that kind of attitude leans the conversation. Here's another argument in the favor to kind of like to, to bounce off of what I'm saying right now. And it's funny, it's, it's something I just heard recently uh, with regards to uh, childcare. It was, you know, those videos you see very often online, like a pediatrician debunks nine myths. And I think that's the one specifically. There were these two pediatricians that were talking about myths when it came to childhood. And one of the things that one of the things that was one of the myths that they were debunking was you have to protect children from hard realities. You have to protect them from it. And the pediatrician said, you have to be age appropriate with the kind of information that you share. But hiding the truth of harsh realities from kids can create a sense of false hope. Like for instance, if their dog died, a dog that they love dearly, and you know it's going to tear their heart in pieces. If you tell the child, for instance, well, the dog went away. He, 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 he's, he's sleeping right now. He's, he's gone away to, to a special place. What that, you might be trying to protect their feelings from sad news, but that can fill the child with a sense of false hope that that dog will return one day and they can sit around with a sense of anticipation that this, this dog is going to show up one day when they're not. And what you have to do is allow a child to grieve, allow a child to face the reality of what's going on. And the dog died. Your dog passed away. He's not around anymore. His body's not working anymore. You're not going to see your dog again. He's gone now. And let them cry and let it hurt, but also allow them to learn about life and death and nature <laughs> and biological organisms that are only renting their bodies temporarily, including you and I, I might add. And as Jim Carrey said, I just managed to get the sportier model, right? <laughs> it's a reality. Yes, I get that. But notice how the pediatrician wasn't saying, hey, shit happens, buddy. <laughs> Dogs die. You got to get used to that. Would you think of talking to a child that way about life and death? No? Well, you're talking to a student, an art student, about their future, about their worth, about their ability to succeed, their ability to make a living for themselves, aka survive as a member of the species. I would say that's pretty substantial. In fact, I would say that's far more substantial than a dog passing away because it has much longer ramifications. It has, it's a longer lasting toxicity if you deliver them some very negative piece of news that does nothing but shut them up, sit them down and tell them, don't waste my time. I'm going to give you one more reason why I very strongly believe that a teacher should lead by encouragement, by recognizing somebody's strengths and not their weaknesses, by, by teaching and aiming to offer somebody growth by not kicking them down. As a teacher who's taught, as I said, thousands of students in the school board, in the public school board, privately in my mentorship, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I can say with absolute certainty that out of the thousands of students that I have taught, the number one reason by a landslide why students struggle with art and growth is not a lack of inspiration or motivation, or at least that's not the primary reason. I feel that's a byproduct. That's a 
symptom of the real reason. And the real reason, the number one reason why students struggle, have a hard time learning, have a hard time getting up in the morning, having have a hard time picking up that pen, finding ideas, discovering themselves, exploring, allowing themselves to fail over and over again. What holds them back is a crippling sense of guilt. It's pure, flat out guilt. Guilt that they're not trying hard enough, that they're not good enough, that they're not their art isn't attractive enough, that they don't have enough talent, that they're not smart enough. The list goes on and on and on of reasons why artists feel like shit about themselves. Why is that? Well, think about it. There's no gauge. 99% of an artist's growth is done in a little cocoon called their little mind. Their little ecosystem of thought inside their head that never even penetrates to the outside. We are alone a lot of this time. We are self-motivated. We are self-inspired. And nine times, 99% of the time, we are self-educated as well, going online, learning new stuff, accessing different artists, tutorials, all that kind of stuff. By the time students have reached out to me to take my mentorship, or Anthony, or Bobby, or Tyler, or any of these, or Mark Brunet, Ahmed, all of these artists who teach online, by the time they've made it to that point, guaranteed they've spent at least six months to a year at least minimum smacking their head against the concrete wall trying to figure out where the hell to go next with their art when artists reach out to me is because they feel they're at their wits end and i'd say a good seven out of those ten artists when once we get to know each other because it's a private mentorship we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations all the time i'd say the majority of these students that i deal with have had some encounter at some point in time, if they're experienced at all, I'm not talking about bare bones beginners, but I'm talking about artists who've been doing this for at least, let's say three to five years plus, have encountered a teacher online or in the traditional school who made them feel like shit, who demotivated them, who gave them a bad mark. I don't even know why the marking system even exists in art. What the hell does a grade mean in art? I don't get that. I, I never got it in school. I don't get it in art. There's no grading in art education, in my opinion. This isn't arithmetic. This isn't a yes or no answer. This is a creative process. So, you know, but they'll get a bad grade and a negative mark despite their greatest efforts. And these are artists that try so hard. 99% of my students love art are passionate about it, want to learn. Even if they're bare bones beginners, they come to me with a strong sense of passion and a strong sense of hard work. They really want to grow. They really want to achieve. And when I first meet these students, very often the first impression I get from them is fear of not impressing me. Adam, the YouTuber, Adam, the teacher, Adam, the blah, blah, blah. They've, they've got this idea of grandeur of me because I'm a 45 year old guy who's been doing this for some time and has some experience and they go oh shit I yeah, you know I'm sorry I, I know Mike it's a bit sloppy and everything I'm kind of really trying I'm trying to adapt because I'm used to drawing traditionally and I'm not used to working on a digital tablet it's just and they're so freak they're so stressed out they're sweating and their voice is shaking and I tell them it's okay <laughs> the more you suck the more value I have as a teacher. So look at it that way. If you're absolute garbage, then everything I say, everything I say is gonna sound really awesome and you're gonna to be too, super impressed by everything I share with you. And they have a good laugh, their shoulders drop, and we spend the rest of, the, we spend the rest of that session together being friends and learning together. Furthermore, one of the things I've learned, I actually learned this from a TED Talk, or at least it was reinforced by a TED Talk. Remember something. The best way to help a person, a community, is to do more listening than talking. A good teacher, somebody who's good at giving advice, does more asking than answering. Okay? It's not to mean that I don't provide answers all day, every day, but I will not provide, or at least I try my best with what limited self-discipline I have, I try my best to shut up and stop talking and listen. Listen. I don't shoot my mouth off for half an hour. I listen. 
because you you might realize something you didn't know. You might, if you really, really, really want to teach this person, if you really want them to grow, it's, it requires more than just feeding them a curriculum and asking them to, to vomit it out verbatim. No, it's about listening, finding out where they're coming from, what obstacles they've dealt with, learn who they are as individuals and help them based off of that. Trust me, the way you teach them will be far more valuable. So to all of you artists, or all of you teachers out there that might be a little bit rough on your students or grade them a little bit harshly, I, I encourage you, take a step back and deep breath and put yourself in the shoes of your students for just a moment. And to students who have been demotivated and have been put down or poorly graded that you feel unjustly despite your greatest efforts and it's holding you back, it's time to let that go. It's not your fault. It never was your fault. You're awesome, you work hard, and you deserve all the praise in the world. With that said, I love you all with all my heart, and happy painting. Take care.